So in, in, in light of um, there not being any Wi-Fi here, I've, uh, I, I'm also going with low tech. Um, there's not going to be any PowerPoint presentation. Um, and I hope that's all right with you. Uh, Tim started um, his presentation earlier this morning talking about a quote from a United States president, Harry Truman. Uh, I'm going to quote another US president. And don't worry, it's not Donald Trump. Um, it's um, a, a pre someone who was president 90 years ago, uh, Silent Cal, he was known, or Calvin Coolidge, Silent Cal. And before an audience of United States newspaper editors said in 1925, the business of the American people is business. And I've always liked that quotation because I think it uh, really encapsulates the fact that so much of our activities so much of that activity takes place in the commercial sector that if you, if you do not preserve it in some way, so much of what we do in our daily lives gets lost. Uh, and I've always taken that to heart uh, since I came to Hagley uh, about six years ago. So um, in, in some ways for this segment, I think it's entirely appropriate that uh, the organizers put me in this spot um, and that uh, it, it, uh, we have the, we have the, the, the records of, of thousands of companies um, like, like the center itself does. Um, and um, about a, more than a thousand scholars visit us every year and over a hundred thousand visit us online. Um, we get about a million page views a year from our, through our digital archives. So what I wanna do today is uh, three, three short things. Uh, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about Hagley, what our mission is, uh, who our stakeholders and interest groups are. Um, and I will tell you from the start that originally we saw that stakeholder as being primarily the scholars, not the businesses. Okay, that's, that's changed a little bit, um, but we, we have tended over time, and we've actually um, interacted with our depositors this way on this point, that um, having uh, ordinary scholars have access to archives uh, is not a, not a liability, but it's a strength. Okay, the, um, uh, it liberates data and it creates knowledge. So hearkening back uh, to what Catherine was saying this morning. Secondly, I wanna explain a little bit about how we've evolved to invigorate our engagement with business stakeholders. Um, and that's really about transparency. That's a story about transparency. And uh, then finally, um, how a commitment to transparency and openness serves both researchers and uh, depositors, um, sharing stories and preserving facts. Okay, so uh, first, Hagley is a museum and library. Um, I run the library part. I'm not executive director of the whole shebang. I'm just um, uh, the director of the library. And uh, we're based in Wilmington, Delaware, on the site of the original DuPont Company's historic gunpowder manufacturing site. And I learned in the last week, as many of you did, that the merger between Dow and DuPont has been approved uh, in the European Union. So um, it's really, uh, for, for where I live, it's very much a, a kind of blow to many people because uh, DuPont used to employ tens of thousands of people in the state of Delaware. Um, and that number is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Um, but I'm happy to tell more about that over beer sometime. Um, we've become the must-visit library or repository uh, for scholars who want to write on the subject of American capitalism, innovation, and industrial design. Um, we also, as I mentioned, alluded to earlier a little bit, uh, we have a, a, a museum. It's uh, basically a 19th century site museum uh, 235 acres, um, water-powered mill still in operation. We demonstrate how gunpowder was made in the, uh, in the 19th century. Um, and also, as part of the museum, we have uh, the second largest collection of patent models, um, which um, it used to be a requirement in the 19th century uh, to have a miniature-scaled model along with your patent application. Um, the Hagley Library was founded in 1961, uh, but in fact grew out of the private collection of Pierre Samuel DuPont, P.S. DuPont as we know him, or P.S.D.P., um, was one of three cousins who transformed the DuPont company from an explosives manufacturer into a chemical giant at the beginning of the 20th century. After he died in 1954, the Longwood Library, it was still called, uh, was created and endowed by his estate. Um, in nearby Pennsylvania, 
If some of you have been to Longwood Gardens, that was his estate. Uh, it's a very large garden museum. Um, but in, um, its board very early on decided that they, they wanted to document the history of the American Industrial Revolution. Well, you can imagine how quickly the archive grew. And it very quickly outgrew its home. And so the decision was made to merge the library with this new museum, which had just opened up in 1957 down the road, called Hagley Museum. Um, and hence, we became Hagley Library. Uh, con construction was started on a, uh, on a building and was finished in 1961. Uh, since then, our collections have grown several fold. We, all, we used to uh, be fit in one building. We now need three buildings to hold all of our materials. Um, we've become the leading research collection uh, on the history of American business, technology, and industrial design. And we've got more than 11,500 meters of manuscript materials, 300,000 published volumes, 3 million photographs, prints, and audio and videotapes, and half a million digital pages, uh, as well as several terabytes of born digital material and digitized media. Um, we've been innovative in the last 10 years or so with digitizing collections as well as collecting born digital materials. We're also pushing into um, history projects with oral history projects with depositors. Um, our history is ongoing. We continue to collect, and um, our position has been from, uh, from since about 15 years ago that if we weren't prepared to collect born digital materials, we would become obsolete uh, within a generation. And so we continue to collect uh, now um, digital materials because that's where the decisions are being made. Hagley is what it, what it is known in the United States as a 501c3 organization. That's a reference to a clause in the United States tax code that describes our tax status as a nonprofit educational institution. Um, and that prohibits us from certain kinds of political and advocacy activities. Um, because we're in the category of research institutions, it's not really a surprise that Hagley focused on the research community as its primary stakeholder. Um, and uh, that's gone on now for decades. Uh, profession I'm, I'm expansive in that, uh, in that definition. Professional historians, students writing thesis works, journalists, genealogists, biographies, documentary filmmakers all find their way to, to Hagley. Um, I should add that uh, we are also the administrative home of the Business History Conference, which is the largest academic organization of business historians in North America. And we are also the editorial home for the journal Enterprise and Society, published with the Cambridge University Press. We're free and open to the public um, that wants to engage in historical research. Now, a number of collections at Hagley, in fact, some of the most loved and used collections, are deposits. In other words, Hagley does not own them. Uh, they are owned um, by their depositing organ uh, or, uh, organizations, and they're on permanent loan at Hagley. Uh, and we found that um, many organizations are interested in preserving their heritage, um, but the skills necessary to maintaining their own archive are uncomfortably far removed from their core missions and also the funds are not necessarily available for creating and maintaining an archive and a museum. Uh, they're unexpectedly high. Just to give you a, 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 partial, a quick partial list, I mentioned that DuPont is a depositor, so is Avon, uh, Penn Virginia, which is a coal company, Sunoco, which has been bought out by Energy Transfer Partners recently, Conrail, as well as a number of trade associations like the National Association of Manufacturers, the US Chamber of Commerce, the National Foreign Trade Council, uh, the Conference Board and the National uh, Auto Dealers Association. Okay. Um, so when companies look at what they want to preserve and find that it's just not in their wheelhouse, their, ex uh, their expertise, this is where Hagley comes in. Okay? And oftentimes we are approached uh, by organizations when they're approaching a milestone, year 25, 50, 100, whatever, um, when they're in transition, that is to say they're being purchased or they're merging with another organization, um, or they're becoming concerned with secession issues. Um, we've talked about that a, a little bit already here in this conference. Um, maintaining Hag heritage is what we've done at Hagley for over 50 years. That includes processing, cataloging, providing reference services for our depositors, as well as researchers. 
uh, and conserving um, and conservation are tra traditional competencies of ours. Um, I might point out also that um, depositors are comfortable with us doing that work. We put a 25-year embargo uh, on material that hasn't been created for public consumption. That is to say, um, advertisements and material, things that have been put out by communications and promotions um, typically are behind, you know, out back uh, in documentation, so to speak. And we impose a 25-year embargo on that. And that, is, uh, that may, basically means that m material that is strategically important to the company has become stale by the time that uh, the 25-year elapses. Um, our investments in digitization, digital preservation, and oral history ensure that we can collect, process, preserve, and share 21st century collections. Um, and um, <clears throat> also when it comes to digital and sharing, we act often as the agent for, uh, for our depositors in terms of giving permissions uh, for reproductions by scholars and so forth. Um, through our work, we've become a trusted source uh, with depositors for maintaining their histories and providing access to, to their histories. Uh, because very often, uh, depositors don't know themselves what is in their collections. Uh, and in fact, it's the engagement with the scholarly community which often makes them aware of what's actually in their collections. So what was missing until recently was a concerted effort to grow our deposit collections. Uh, that's one of the things that I started doing when I came on board. Um, put another way, we did not see depositors as a central stakeholder uh, in our mission. To rectify this, we created a membership program called, that we called Hagley Heritage Curators. Hagley Heritage Curators to pursue collections we believe to be of interest to other stakeholders. So we market HHC, as we call it, as a, we call it a prestige offering. Uh, we're selective, we don't take everybody's collections because we can't preserve everything. We don't have the space or the resources to be able to do that. We look for selective exemplars from particular industries and we pursue them. Um, and we market the, uh, the, the, the connections that we can build between uh, our clients, and uh, not only with their own past, but with uh, professional historians and other researchers um, who use it as the material. Basically, um, depositors want a product, we want an archive. And that's the way that the relationship gets uh, formed. Um, that basically puts us in the role of being a mediator between the historical community and the depositor, the corporation or the trade association. Um, it's an interesting relationship um, to be in the middle of. It is um, of, of great interest to some depositors, less so to others. In our experience, depositors are understandably concerned about litigation. And I haven't heard that come up very much yet, but I think it should be. Over the years, we've developed experience that, uh, with this. And I have to say that when I took the job on, I never thought that I'd, uh, I'd get subpoenaed, um, but I do. Uh, and, uh, and our experience with litigation research is qualitatively different from historical research, though. Uh, our access policies require that a researcher stipulate that they're not engaged in litigation. We refer litigation researchers to the owners of the deposit of, uh, uh, to the, of the deposits for access. And um, one thing that I want to point out is uh, in discussions with depositors who are nervous about this, I often say, look, one, um, the lack of documentation is not a positive defense. Okay, and so sometimes having the paperwork preserved is actually a good thing. Um, <clears throat> Businesses and their archives are, are useful in litigation action. Um, and businesses often need help in interpreting what those documents actually mean. Uh, and we've got a reference staff that helps them do that and also helps researchers with their research. We play this mediation role in partly because of our close connection with the research community. Um, we maintain a research center that administers a grants and aid program, as well as seminars and conferences. As noted earlier, the center also uh, um, is the home of the Business History Conference. And uh, knowing what these researchers want and what the emerging trends are and questions and topics has given us a reputation as a trusted partner to depositors, but also the arbiter for transparency uh, on the other 
with, uh, with the research community. Uh, it's a model that's rather unique um, with American nonprofits, but it's one that uh, we have experience, uh, considerable experience with. Um, so we're committed to sustaining uh, our connections and, with, uh, and preserving the work of American businesses and trade associations. It's not a simple role, preserving and also mediating, um, but it's one that uh, we've been engaged in for nearly 60 years.